Alright, Goose. You ready to do this? <laughs> yep, okay. Alright, let's get it. Let's get this guy. Y'all, I'm disappointed. I watched H2O season 3, and I didn't like it. And I feel so tacky saying that, because like, wah, the second I stopped watching it was no longer the target demographic, this show sucked. It's like those people who always say that SNL stopped being good when they stopped being 12. It's just like, are you sure, Mary? But if you've watched my review of the earlier seasons, you know season three and I had an uphill battle. I watched the first two seasons when I was a young, impressionable child who'd still had some level of hope in the world. So of course, even though I tried my best to remain objective in this review, I can't help that my nostalgia carried me through the first two seasons and it wasn't there for season three. But on top of that, season three wasn't even originally meant to happen. When the producers made the show back in 2006, they made the standard two seasons of 26 episodes. And of course, when they saw how successful it was, they would have been crazy not to try for another season. But I think it's easy to forget just how different the children's television industry is from 2006 to now. Like SpongeBob is like the big exception, but most popular kids shows would only be syndicated for one or two seasons and then they would just rerun them because what are kids gonna do? Change the channel? There's only four of them. So for a kid's show to get a third season, it has to be a pretty huge success to guarantee a return. But of course, it was a big success and season three did happen. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the actors that appeared in season one and two hadn't planned for that. Claire Holt, who played Emma, had already committed to filming a movie in Bulgaria when season three was set to film. What movie, you may ask? Messengers 2, The Scarecrow. The plot description on IMDb truly gives me nothing because all it says is, doing what he believes must be done in order to save his family and livelihood. That guy from The Walking Dead places an odd scarecrow among his crops and promptly reaps the benefits. The thing is, his luck probably won't last long. Was it worth it, Claire? Was it? Now, I was never the biggest fan of Emma, so that wasn't really a big deal to me. But what was a big loss was Lewis. Angus was only available for half of the season, and he does come back for one more scene in the finale, but his absence in the later half of the season definitely impacted my ability to like it. Y'all know, y'all know how much a simp I am for Lewis. That was a sentence. And that wasn't the only change that the writers had to deal with since the show had started in 2006. Season three needed replacement characters that now in 2009, 2010, could compete with the show that changed television for the better part of the decade. Hannah Montana <laughs> aired in 2006 and was a runaway success for the Disney company. If you've watched my series on Demi Lovato, you'll remember Hilary Duff and Lizzie McGuire was the start of Disney using their teen actors to sort of cross promote their record label and TV show. But Hannah Montana was what truly solidified this market for Disney because now Twin Girls were obsessed with the character Hannah Montana and of course the real life actress in person, Miley Cyrus. And Disney was able to simultaneously get huge TV residuals while also profiting off merch, concerts, documentaries, all off the success of one teenage girl. Demi Lovato, Selena Gomez, and the Jonas Brothers were also brought into this marketing by giving them TV and movie appearances where they could also show off their musical talent. And if you've watched any of Quentin Review's uh, videos lately, you'll notice Nickelodeon tried to do this too, arguably less successfully, uh, but they tried their best. They had Drake Bell, Miranda Cosgrove, Jeanette McCurdy, Big Time Rush, The Naked Brothers Band, and of course, Victorious were all made uh, with the hope that this income potential of the music and the show cross-promoting each other would mean big success for the company. And since H2O already needed a new mermaid, why not get one that can also sing and have an album for the show? But let me tell you, when I first played the season three premiere and heard the new version of the theme song, I've got a special power. I just made this face. And it's not that bad. I just, I, I got used to it, but I was just, I was not prepared <laughs> for the change. So this is the part in my past reviews where I would normally break down episode by episode what I thought of the story, but halfway through watching, I realized that that would not be the best way to approach this. And I think that'll become clear as we start to unpack what exactly I didn't like about this season. So instead, let's first talk about the new characters for the season. The first and probably the most important is Bella. Bella is Hannah Montana, if Hannah Montana was a mermaid when she wasn't a pop star, and you took away the charm and personality of Miley Cyrus. And that, <laughs> that sounds mean. Um, I actually don't mind Bella as much as 
as the other new characters and as much as maybe some other people do. Bella is new in town and maybe it's just me, but her introduction, just walking past Ricky and Cleo, gave big sophic energy. I was here for it at the start. Probably wishful thinking on my part, but hey, it's what I saw. And Bella is a singer. I don't think she's a bad singer, but did I space out during most of her songs on the show? Yes. Like for whatever reason, they put this vocal effect on every single one of her songs. And it was just way too like synthetic for me to take it seriously. Like she's supposed to be playing in a live band and she sounds like this. Even in a scene where she's meant to be singing a cappella with no backing whatsoever, they put this effect on her voice. And, and it just reminds me of say a little prayer in Glee when we're supposed to believe Santana and Brittany are providing the backup vocals of an entire church choir for Diana Agron. And if it was say a little prayer, I could forgive her, but it's not. <laughs> Your music just sounds so like generically Disney corporate that I, I wasn't interested. But pretty quickly into season three, the girls find out that Bella is not just an okay singer, she is a mermaid. And I love the scene where they reveal it because the music swells and the two girls, Ricky and Cleo, look so shocked. But then we just cut to Ricky just being sunk to the depths of hell. more on that later. Bella has actually been a mermaid since she was nine years old, which I think could have been super interesting if the show actually did anything with that or explored it in any meaningful way. Like imagine growing up as a mermaid all alone, not even having the support of two friends, going through puberty and not being able to touch water or like go to a pool party. But other than it just being like a thing that happened, the writers like don't acknowledge it. And Bella also has just the worst power. She can turn water into KY jelly and then harden it if she wants to. I in uh, handy more than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I would have accepted the singing, the Hannah Montana sparkly vest, the weird superpower, if Bella wasn't just so boring. I mean, she's nice, but really beyond being a mermaid, beyond being pretty and liking singing, they never really give Bella a character that's different from the other girls. Like, like, even though Emma could be annoying, she was the smart, practical one and it was always clear how those dynamics between the three girls would be. Emma also like went from being a competitive swimmer and then having to quit and be a mermaid and like that was something interesting. I know they didn't focus on it a ton but it was interesting. It was something. She had strengths, weaknesses. She had a family <laughs> written into the show. Bella doesn't even get that. And she was a fully realized character even from the first episode. Bella just feels like whatever the writers want, want Bella to be at any particular point. But regardless, no matter what, she will get up and sing a song, and she'll probably talk about the other new character, Will. One thing I do really enjoy about Bella though, the actress who played her dated Angus, the guy who played Lewis, and I found an incredible article on their relationship I just have to read to you. They wanted a small yet powerful relationship. They were in a relationship until their breakup in 2012. Even after their breakup, they remained good friends. That's how adults deal with breakups. Both of them first met each other on the set and fell in love. They were a big hit as a couple and became relationship goals for many lovebirds out there. Rumor in the market is that the couple is still in a relationship with each other and they're now ready to get married. But don't believe in those false rumors, they aren't back together. Even if they are together, then surely she'll tell us all about it. But currently, both of them are neither getting married nor engaged. I mean, uh, handier more than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Will is homeschooled himbo free driver. We first see Will going out to Mako Island during a full moon while he's out swimming. And this is when he's attacked by this season's villain, the water tentacle.
Now folks, I hope you liked watching that scene because they include flashbacks to it in what feels like the first 10 episodes. In your mind exactly. Well, I only saw it for a moment. Your accident at Mako Island, I just thought it might help to talk about it. Yeah, I, I didn't really like to. Beginning to think it was all a dream. <laughs> there was this shimmer. Now, the, the waterfall... What did it do exactly? Fired... ...bolts of... ...water into the pool. Anytime Will talks about the water tentacle, the show gives us a flashback. I guess they were just like really proud of how the special effects turned out. I don't know. And Will does have some interesting things going for him. First, I mentioned that he's a himbo, and I, I mean that. Are you sure you'll be alright getting back? My name's Will. Oh, you be. Oh, sorry, I, I couldn't resist the urge to see him up close. Well, this part of the park's off limits to the public. I, I grew up on a yacht sailing around the world with my parents, so I'm kind of hooked on dolphins. I, I've been around them all my life. Well, you can see Ronnie at the dolphin show. Hey, what are you doing? Get out of the water right now. I didn't know you worked here. Sometimes he just acts so goofy. I just like, I can't help. I can't help but giggle. And you know, unlike Ash or Byron, Will does feel like a character, not just a dude that they randomly inserted so a character could have a love interest. But also his free diving and obsession with the ocean actually do make for interesting storylines, even though again, I think they are underutilized. And Bella and Will had that classic, will they, won't they thing going for most of the season. And one plotline they don't spend nearly enough time on is Will's obsession with mermaids. Before Will knows Bella as a mermaid, he ditches her multiple times so he can do his free diving training. Here. Hey. Will, hi, it's Bella. Where are you? Oh, sorry, is that the time? I've been training. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure I can make it now. Something's come up. Oh, that's, that's okay, that's fine. Yesterday, instead of meeting me, he was meeting someone else, a girl. No way. But once he finds out that she's a mermaid, he suddenly wants to swim with her all the time. But wouldn't it be better if you showed me? Hello, public place. There won't be anyone here for ages. Oh, I don't know, I don't Come know. Come on, show me how the expert does it. What happened to being focused? Doesn't mean we can't go for a swim for half an hour or so. I can't get you out of my head. The way you fly through the water like it's part of you, it's, it's beautiful. Well, maybe, maybe we could go get a coffee first and then we could talk. <laughs> I want to see you swim. That's better than any talking. <laughs> yeah, but we could, we could get to know each other a bit better. I know you're a mermaid. <laughs> How much more do I need to know? Yeah, but that's not all I am. Well, of course not, but you've got to admit it is the most amazing part. I guess so. And they really only give one episode to this and never actually resolve it. And they even have a later episode where Will and Bella are like, oh yeah, we actually don't have any common interests outside of me being a mermaid. Oh well. And my least favorite thing, the way Will finds out that Bella is a mermaid. First, when he's getting suspicious, he pressures Bella to tell him the truth and even shows up uninvited on a full moon to make her go to Mako with him. But it'll be easier in the morning after a good night's sleep. I have to go inside. Come with me, please. No, I can't. I don't get this. You say you're there for me, but then when I ask for some support, you start looking at me like I'm crazy, just like everyone else. Will! Is he even an H2O boyfriend if he doesn't do that? But he only actually finds out when he pours water on Bella's hand and basically forces her to tell him. I know you're hiding something from me, but whatever it is, I'm not going to judge you. I know this big secret of yours has something to do with water. No. You're lying to me. No!
trusted you. And like the look on Bella's face, Bella is hurt by him betraying her trust like this. This is a disaster. He's gonna tell everyone. We'll end up on display at the Marine Park with Ronnie. No, you won't. He only thinks that I'm a mermaid. I think he'll figure it out. No, he asked me. I lied. I said I'm the only one. Thanks for protecting us. Please forgive me. I guess what's done is done. Fix it. I'll deal with it and you guys won't have to do anything. And they just like never really resolve the serious breach of trust. And we all just move on from it. It gets even worse when Ricky gets kidnapped. There's there's no time to explain that or why that's happening. And Will is like, yeah, I'll help su save Ricky if you tell me everything you know about mermaids. Well, this is serious. Sophie said you picked up some counterfeit money from the wharf. Fake money. We think she went to take it back. You have to tell us everything you know. On one condition, you tell me everything you know about mermaids. So then Cleo and Ricky are then also forced to reveal that they are mermaids to him. And just like the look in his eye, like it's almost like he, he fetishizes them being mermaid. And it's wild to me that they take the time to point out that he seems only interested in them because they're mermaids. And they just like never have him grow or change he just like gets to be obsessed with him and we're all just supposed to be okay with it and he also basically replaces lewis as the main male character halfway through the show which is fine like the girls do need someone who knows their secret to be helpful i guess zane probably would have been a more interesting option for that role um if they hadn't wrecked his character in this season or on that later but what did bother me was this yeah i guess How dare you take that man's ringtone? Shame, shame on all of you. Third major new character is Sophie, Will's sister. She has red hair, and so we all know what that means. Let's say it together. She is evil, at least by, by the internal logic of the show. She's the villain for the season, and she's basically just a recycled version of Miriam from season one. For reasons completely unclear to me, she really wants Zane, even though he's with Ricky. Side note, someone in the comments said that Zane looks like a fish from SpongeBob, and I can't, I can't unsee that. She's also Will's momager and really wants him to be a champion freediver, because I guess competitive freediving is super lucrative. Um, and she hates Bella because Bella is like, don't train, be free. Also, not technically a new character, but a big change from seasons one and two. Zane's dad, off screen, they don't bring him back for the show, buys the Juice Net Cafe, and so then Zane is the new manager. And Ricky at first is upset because she had just told Zane that she wanted to buy the cafe and revamp it so that the people could come and listen to bands play, especially bands with blonde girls and sparkly vests. But don't worry. Zane took over so that these two could be business partner under the new name Ricky's. And at first I thought this was super cute, like all oh, their like little managers of this place, maybe they'll decide what juices go on the menu or pick the band. I mean they're they're 16, 17. How much responsibility can it be really be? But no. As shown by this da boss nameplate, Zane means serious business. Suddenly, Ricky and Zane are fighting over finances. The cafe is always one week from going under, and these two basically become like an old married couple struggling to keep the business open following the 2008 housing recession. And Bella is just like the unaware child who just wants her premium Club Penguin membership. And it's just like, Ricky, please let me and the band sing at every possible opportunity. Like she's trying her best, Bella. It's hard out here. But I know you're all still thinking about that water tentacle I just casually mentioned uh, a few minutes ago and wondering what the heck the plot of the season is. Ricky is snatched by a water tentacle on the full moon and nearly drowns before Bella and Cleo are able to save her. There's something going on here, isn't there? Something magical. That's ridiculous. There is no such thing as magic. <laughs> No. 
Now, whenever there's a full moon, a mysterious water tentacle comes out and violently attacks the three girls. I really miss when the full moon used to just get the girls like blackout drunk and make them swim in public, like just harmless fun. And because Emma isn't here, Cleo sort of takes over that brainiac role. And I will say, the scenes of Lewis and Cleo trying to do science experiments to figure out what this water tentacle is are some of my favorite moments from this season, and like, I actually really enjoyed them. It feels like these past two years with Emma and Lewis have really taught Cleo to actually like love and appreciate science, and she's like a lot less shy than she was in the earlier seasons, and a lot less afraid to just be nerdy and take charge, which I feel like is actually like really good like character development. I was, in I was impressed. But then of course, they send Miss Lewis away. Phoebe puts all of her, her acting ability into this goodbye scene. He's gone. It hurt me, personally, but the girls eventually realize, okay, the water turns into a tentacle and attacks, but only when the three of us to get are together, on a full moon. So, naturally, let's all hang out together every full moon with our useless boyfriends for protection. And when Bella gets taken by the water tentacle, she starts turning into water, which again, Phoebe is not messing around this season. She is selling the horror of seeing your unconscious friend turn into water before your eyes. It looks like it's turning her into water. Bella! Take her. So the next full moon, the girls all plan to hide at the cafe, and Zane is like, great, I hear you, I see you, I am inviting all of my friends over as well, and you guys can just hide in my office while I hang with my friends. And also Kim is there, for whatever reason. And so Ricky is upset that her boyfriend is displaying season one behavior and goes to confront the water tentacle. And Will tries to stop her, and even though he goes to help her, men are useless, and the water tentacle attacks Will. And even though it attacked Will, Ricky now feels a deep connection with the water tentacle. The tentacle is really special. I made a connection with it, like a real connection. And she spends the next couple episodes just being a dick to her friends and boyfriend because she just wants to hang out with the water tentacle. Stranger, I've hardly seen you lately. I've been busy. What's so special about the moon pool all of a sudden? You wouldn't understand. You versus the guy she tells you not to worry about. <laughs> Meanwhile, Cleo is still running experiments on the rock from Mako Island when she meets handsome rock man, Ryan Tate. Now, if any of you have watched the originals, you might know that Phoebe Tonkin and Claire Holt actually both appeared on that show, and I think a lot of people were really hoping that they would just complete the trio and cast Ricky on the show as well. Well, it turns out the actor who played Ryan was also on the originals. Give us the H2O Vampire Diaries crossover series. But Rockman discovers that the magnetism of Mako Island's rocks are off the charts. Levels that he's only seen on the moon. Apparently. And Ricky, of course, because she's seen season one, is like, hey, maybe don't let a scientist get too close to stuff from Mako. He could find out where the rock came from and ruin our secret. And the others are like, oh, OMG, you're so crazy, Ricky. That would never happen. Ricky finds Rockman on Mako, of course. And I'm only including this scene because I could only imagine it with this music as I watched it. So here you go. <laughs> y'all cover up the side entrance to your secret mermaid hideout i think enough people have fallen through that hole now guys luckily rockman doesn't really find much when he's there but they can't hold him off 
forever. Bella has her own uglier merch, I mean necklace, that she wears, which of course she found at the bottom of the pool where she became a mermaid in Ireland. I know, bold coming from someone who wears a crystal every day as well, but mine's just different, okay? When Cleo is examining the moon rock again, they find another piece of this crystal that matches Bella's. So Will makes it into another necklace for Ricky. Yeah, they sort of tried to have like a love triangle between Ricky, Will, and Bella because children's sitcom. But Will and Ricky are never interested in each other. But nevertheless, Will being in the group is for some reason Zane's justification for a lot of his dickish behavior this season. Like one time, Zane offers to sponsor Will's like free diving stuff. And first, he fakes himself going deeper than Will. You need to slow your heart rate down, get your breathing under control, even before you even think of it. You didn't get to 40 meters. Well, the marker says different, unless you're calling me a cheat. You know, maybe I should just sponsor myself to enter this competition. I do just as well. Diving to that depth is not something you just do. Oh, you mean it's something you don't do. You want to know what I can do? Will. And watch this, 60 meters. Which leads to Will going too deep and nearly drowning. And whenever Will is invited to mermaid stuff, Zane will just like fly off the candle, again, as if he has had no character development from season one. This actually all comes to a head when Zane and Sophie are watching Will free drive, and Sophie just kisses Zane. Of course, not knowing Ricky is also there and saw the whole thing. That's a new record! We did it! We found Honestly, Zane's actor does a little too good of a job of acting like a bad ex-boyfriend after this. Day? Yeah. Great. This has been huge for us. You should have been there for the dive. I was. You and Sophie seem very pleased with each other. Look, it's, it's nothing to get upset about. I'm not. I've known that we were over for a while. Over. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Ricky. I say. Ricky. So when Will gives Ricky the, the crystal after Zane has cheated on Ricky and they've broken up, it doesn't even surprise me that Zane throws a fit and steals the necklace. Hey, I've been looking for you. Yeah, and? Your necklace. Yeah, I got it from a friend. What kind of friend? Leave it alone, it's none of your business. I'm moving on, so should you. Yeah, I've moved on too, so just tell me his name. And of course, as a previous Zane apologist and Zeke shipper, I'm heartbroken. And as a viewer, I'm just frustrated because that basically makes Will the main lead protagonist by default. And I just don't trust Will to handle a water tentacle for them. I don't even trust Will to drive himself home. I'm not saying Zane has to be like the perfect boyfriend now to be a good character, but it seemed like they made the decision to make Zane like this just terrible boyfriend so that they could justify spending more time on Will and Bella's relationship. And I just, I don't care about these two. Yes, they look pretty, but I don't want to watch these two randos. Anyways, back to the water tentacle. The girls are able to find another piece of crystal, and of course, these three pieces of crystal all fit perfectly in this little mold that the Moonpool Cave has, which would make you think that there were only three pieces of this crystal, but in the season finale, the wall of the cave gets blown up, and there's tons more of that crystal in there. So they just happen to find three little pieces that fit perfectly. Fine, whatever. But the crystals, trigger the water tentacle <laughs> and we begin to see a horrifying prophetic vision which of course is interrupted once again by men because of course the the men are useless in the season hey hey hiya 
that doing? What are you doing here? We thought you guys needed help. What would make you think we needed help? There... There was this... There was this light. Right? The boys are just like, we're here to help. And the girls are like, actually go away, please. Please, it seemed as stupid. But they go back later and see the rest of the vision. So it turns out that the water tentacle that was earlier trying to violently drown them wasn't actually dangerous. It was trying to send a message. A message that a comet is on track to destroy the entire planet. And conveniently, they learn of an old Irish legend where another comet was coming to Earth when a mysterious little girl with the crystal got in the water, made a big beam of light, and made the comet go away, never to be seen again. Who is this little girl? How do we know this actually happened? There's no time to, for these questions. The apocalypse is nigh. But Sophie and Rockman convince Zane that if they can find the crystals the girls have, they'll be able to save the cafe from financial ruin. And the 2008 financial crisis is already affecting Zane's hairline, so he has no choice but to go with them. And like I said, they blow up the rock and find a ton, just a ton of these crystals. But I guess they do like a terrible job of doing the explosion because the explosion basically forces them all to run out immediately. Like rocks are falling every direction. Like this cave is going to implode. Zane kind of gets redeemed at the end because he goes with Will to get Sophie and Rockman out of the cave. But I mean, it feels so small when compared to how awful he was this season. And I'm also not sure if Zane actually being there made a difference to the plot of the finale at all. And so Bella decides that just like the Irish folktale, it is her job to fulfill her destiny and save the world from the impending comedy. But the other girls are like, no, that was even worse than the other two. I've learned nothing. They're like, no, we can, we can do it together. So the three of them jump into the water and start doing hand gestures like no one's business. And together with the water tentacle, they're able to stop the comet from going towards Earth and save the world. And so the final scene are the three girls graduating with Cleo getting an award for her commitment to science and who should come strolling in but the king himself. And Zane and Ricky are friends again, I guess. And of course, the show ends with Bella singing the theme song of the show. It's all about living in the ocean, baby, I don't think it gets any more finale than that, that's for sure. Yeah, that, that was this season. So as I already said, um, I wasn't a huge fan. And besides what I've already mentioned, there are a few other reasons. For one, the water tentacle could have been an interesting arc, but the story is so dragged out over the top nonsensical. I swear, if it doesn't make sense to you now, it's not because I explained it poorly. Like, that is the plot of the show. Also, the issue with an environmental antagonist is you don't love to hate it the way you would, like, character like Charlotte or Dr. Denman. It also just feels totally, like, disconnected from the other two seasons because, at its core, I feel like the show is about normal girls dealing with normal problems just sort of amped up for TV. And even when they were mermaids, all the problems of season one and two felt at least like somewhat rooted in reality, like if they were real teenage mermaids living in Australia. But this just feels like a, a really filler Marvel movie, like not a good Marvel movie. But my second problem, the one that bothered me the most while watching it, but is probably the stupidest <laughs> complaint of them all, is that the season is just like so repetitive. At first, I actually really enjoyed that they upped the swimming sequences because I feel like we didn't always just get to see the girls just like having fun swimming around. Even I was tired of all the swimming B-roll when they still couldn't explain what this water tentacle was. Because if I were to do an episode by episode plot recap for you all, I would have to cut out every time that the girls are randomly swimming around, Bella's singing, or there's a flashback of Will getting attacked. I don't want to do the math, 
I, and frankly, I won't. But I feel like that cuts out like a third of the season. And these episodes are only like 20 minutes. So it just felt inflated for no reason. There should not be this much filler in these kinds of shows. Because in the season finale, the girls take a test, get rid of Sophie and Rockman, save the world, graduate and have a party. Imagine if they had built up that story all throughout the seasons instead of just one or two of Bella's songs. It just made the pacing seem all the more weird when there was like so many times they could have inserted more plot. And it also just frustrates me because these new characters actually did create like some interesting dynamics and plot lines. Like there are still fun moments, like when Zane throws a motorbike race and the girls use their power to help Will win. Also a fun episode where the water tentacle like absorbs Cleo's fish Hector, who has been through it in the show. And so the girls are like running around trying to distract Will while also chasing down this floating fish. Will! Ah, oh, just the person I was looking for. I need a hand. Doing what? Ah, uh, the kitchen tap is stuck. Is that your fish? That just felt like so reminiscent of, of the earlier seasons. It was ridiculous, it was fun, and it was all contained in a single episode. And I, I loved it. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's still an okay show. And if I had watched it as a kid, I probably would have enjoyed it just fine. But I'm a bitter adult studying for the bar exam for 10 hours a day now, so I just don't have the energy for nonsense these days. Also, Nate was wearing a Trojan condom shirt, not once, but twice. That didn't fit anywhere in this video, but I had to mention that, right? Well, with that, I hope you all enjoyed this. I'm sorry, I feel I feel so tacky giving a, a bitter review to a show I used to watch as a child and hating like the new season, but I, I can't help myself. And if you disagree, agree, definitely let me know in the comments. Looking back on 2010's media is still always just like so fun for me, so happy to do more of these like series reviews, series yeah, that makes sense <laughs> in the future. If you like this video, feel free to like, maybe even subscribe, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.